last pupil of Mary Queen of Angels. Noel graduated in 1971, is that what you said to me? Yeah. All right, so that's many years ago. And Noel has worked in the Defence Forces for the last 43 years. 43 years. Yeah. And Noel is due to retire in December from the Defence Forces. So he wants to come back to his old primary school, say hello to us all, see how it's changed, and to tell you a little bit about his career in the Army. So I hope you listen, and I know you've been talking and discussing and thinking of questions that you'd like to ask. I'm sure Noel will do his best to answer all those questions at the end. I'll hand you over to Noel. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, my name is Noel. I'm, I'm um, the son of, of Edward and Susan O'Callaghan, and I come from Ardenmore Road in Valley Fairway here. Anyone from Ardenmore? No? Okay. It's up, it's up near the top end near Cherry Orchard Hospital. Um, my, my three brothers were in the school after me, and uh, Tony, Edward, and Francis. But uh, coming back to you see is, was, was on my book just before I retired on Christmas Day because uh, it meant it was an important time for me. And, and you probably don't realise that now, but I'm no longer young enough to know everything. So, but I do know that some things are important, and uh, your school days are really important. Um, I'm going to mention Patriots in the next few minutes and heroes. <clears throat> but I'd like to just uh, I'd like to just point out something to you. The most important patriot or heroes that, that you will ever meet, and you, you, you probably don't even recognise it, are your mum and dad. Uh, you take them for granted because they do everything you know and, and you come home and sometimes they might even give out to you. But they are they will they are what gives you everything to come here today to learn from your teachers and they're, they're very important and don't under, underestimate them. And the other thing, the most important thing I'll be talking about today is people. So I'm just going to give you a, a small slideshow uh, from when I was in Chad. Chad is in, is in Africa. Uh, I was there in 2009. We were part of a, a mechanized group. Chad had been uh, in a war area for so long that they had nothing and I made nothing which you'll see some evidence of. But what they had was they had great pride and they had great resilience and they had each other. And, and, and having each other was very important because I'm sure you have friends here in the classrooms that you depend on. Uh, if, you want to, uh, if you need help, go to your friend. But I just want to point out that someone in your class may not be your friend or you may not even like them. But you, you don't have to like a person to, to help them. And you certainly don't like to have to, uh, like a person to work with them professionally. And, and in the Defence Forces, in the Army, uh, in my regiment I have 240 troops with me. Uh, so I can't pick and choose who I work with. They're all important to me. So I'm just going to show you this. Hopefully it'll work. If it doesn't, I don't have to sing as a song or something. <laughs> Yeah. 
and they came home on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock and I went up to meet them up there, you know. So, uh, Sergeant Major, by the way, is like the father of Nolan once, you know. <laughs> it, it, it wouldn't be everyone's first choice to see him coming over uh, and not see the mission. So, look, the Irish soldiers were well trained, their lads were well trained, they're well equipped, uh, they're, they're multi skilled, and just to give you an idea, so the reason why I brought this, uh, this is our pen. The reason why I'm showing it to you is because uh, I, for, I have a mantra in, in my regiment. Where the regiment goes, the major goes, and where the major goes, the pennant goes. So anytime we, we were deployed, whether it be in the Glen, or shooting teams, or on a, on a mission, that pennant is always in my pack. And it just reminds people, uh, it's a super reminder to my lads, of, of regardless of the mission of who they are, you know. But in terms of upskilling, <coughs> we started off as a conventional uh, artillery regiment. And as you can see there, this is a, a, a shock of, of uh, the 105 heavy gun burden in the Glen. But, uh, and that was our traditional uh, guns and mortars, mortars for overseas service. This here, though, is a picture taken in 2016 in Sweden where we're firing <coughs> me, the Milan missile. We now have air defense assets, uh, which is a very important uh, part of our, of our skills base now. So I just wanted to show you to, to, to say that we've come from field, traditional field artillery to uh, Milan missiles, air defense, and we also have a skill called surveillance and target acquisition, uh, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, our lads are well disciplined. We, we, we very rarely have any problems uh, with, with our lads. The only time you would see a <coughs> soldier getting in trouble is if he has too much drink. So that's the moral of the story is everything in moderation, you know. Uh, there's, there's multiple threats, and, and it doesn't matter what the country is. Uh, if you, Kosovo is a, is a European country, and I served there in 2003. Uh, it's a landlocked country had come out uh, of a lot of uh, troubles and there were still and, and in next fact we still have Irish soldiers in Kosovo to this day you know so uh, the threats are, can be multiple uh, you see them there earlier on in the, in the, the slideshow for Chad uh, everything is about security and the biggest threat to security is thinking there is no threat even your home security so little things like locking the doors at night, these are things that you take for granted. But uh, security is very important. And you can see there the Mullingar sign. We got, I got that off the council heading over because uh, it's just a little thing that I did along the way. Every country I've been in, there's a sign for Mullingar in there. And uh, we, we have to change, we have to change our skills based upon it as we need it. This was a, we were doing riot drill here, uh, training in the Lebanon. That's me, by the way, in the yellow. I was, I was training, I was training the bad guys, the, uh, the attackers. The soldiers there were trying to, to grab me because I was basically causing the violence. But my lads weren't going to let them take me, so they were pulling me back due to the trying to get me in. Although I got a few, a few slaps in the back. Of me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think some of them enjoy it too much. <laughs> uh, <coughs> big team is, hum is humanitarian. This is Eritrea in Africa. They were at war with uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and they gained their freedom. <coughs> Every Sunday, uh, Sunday would be the only day you'd get as a rest day. So myself and nine of my lads used to go up into the mountains. And these were cotton hill children. They had no parents, they were living up in the, off of anything. So we used to ask the boys in the camp for their maybe their fruit ration or their, their biscuits or anything they could give. Uh, and we'd go up and we'd, uh, we'd meet these kids and bring some medication and some stuff like that. And there were simple things like uh, that provided entertainment. You see there in charge, the lads playing football uh, with the local kids. And, and indeed, we had a football team playing against the local team as well. Um, that's all they had was a football. In Eritrea, I used to go around and collect the, uh, the Polish teams and were finished and put stones in them. You know, you're playing piggy and we taught them. 
the new generation, of the young children in Eric Fair, can pick it out based on what they thought they got from the Irish. Uh, peace, you know, it's all about peace, peace in their own country. You know. And uh, I spoke to you earlier on about patriots. And last year we, we had a big thing about uh, 2019 and 16, and I know he's got one of his. Uh, I brought another one, and I know he's got a flag. Um, it's very important to remember our heritage and, and, our, and who we are. We have a big push to become Europeans, but our, our basis is Irish. Uh, we're, we're, we're Irish, yeah? And going down from that again is your family. So, so when you talk, when people talk about Ireland and about the Irish and about nationalism, they're actually talking about you. And they're talking about your parents. Because you're actually the centre of gravity for, for Ireland. Uh, the important people in Ireland aren't up in the Dáil Éireann, the Northern Army headquarters, they're walking around the streets of Ballyferma, they're in this school, in fact they're in this room, and, and it starts with you. So don't ever forget that, don't ever forget how important you are uh, as, a, as a citizen and as a member of society, and what you can give to it. Okay? And uh, I'll take any questions in a minute, and, 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 and uh, I will um, finish off this slideshow. I, just uh, uh, the reason why I, I, I carry this watch with me everywhere, even though I have this one, but, uh, when, we go, when we go on ceremonial, I, I don't allow the lads to wear watches because when they're saluting, when the arm goes up and shows the watch, you know, so that's a big no no in Asia. But, and I'd always tell them, the only watch they need on the day is the major watch. That's the only time it's... The reason why this watch is important to me is because uh, in the 80s when I was involved with uh, the, the, the services, the sports services for the army, I helped a soldier and his family. I was a sergeant at the time. And once I, I got promoted then to another rank, a battery sergeant, but then 12 years ago I got promote uh, the regiment sergeant major. Today I got the regiment sergeant major. That soldier and his wife who were doing this watch um, thanked me for what I had done for them. But um, I had never told anyone what I had done for them, obviously. But the reason why I carry it was <coughs> it's a rewarder for me every time I promise a uniform of how important that without my lads I, I have nothing. I can have the best equipment in the world, I can have the best doctrine, the best training. Without the people, we have nothing. Absolutely nothing. And it's the same for everything. Uh, same for, you could have the most modern school in the world here. But without good teachers and without pupils, it's, a, it's only a building. You know? So it's very important. Um, I'll finish off a little bit of background about myself, and then you can, you can all have any questions you want. Uh, <clears throat> I left here in 1971 to go to the tech as it was. But in actual fact, uh, like I say, I went working. I got a job up in Quinsworth, which used to be up at the top of the road here, up at the roundabout. Um, and then I moved to Kimmage from Quinsworth. And I stayed there nearly two years. And then I got a job in, in the CIE foundry up at Inchy Core. And from there, I got a job in Swarford Printing up in Walkerstown. Amazingly enough, we were making great money. And I used to, go home every Friday uh, to my family, to my mother in particular, with pictures and ridiculous ornaments and, and bags of sweets for my brothers, because uh, we were making great money. But they brought us out on strike and, and uh, we, were, we were all let go. So I went into the Dole office to sign on, age 17, and, and I seen this huge queue. And I knew it wasn't for me, so I, I, I walked home, I turned about, I walked back home. Uh, I never signed on. And what I did was I went to Cathedral Barracks up in Wet Mines and I joined the Army. Uh, which for me was a big step. Because they were sending us 56 of us to Mullingar, which I had never heard of before, ever. And when I asked the corporal, what was this Mullingar place? He told me it was lovely, it had a club and two ship cows on it. And I thought I was going to do it to Chad. Uh, but pleasantly enough, we arrived down and if you can imagine uh, 55 or 56 Dubliners arriving down to a village or a town called Mullingar, 
we were all in parallel trousers with skinheads and bobber boots because that was a style of the time then. You know, um, and it, it, it was amazing, to be honest with you. Uh, we were accepted by a lot of people in there and, and we started making our way through life. Uh, two interesting things happened that year. That week, that first weekend, actually, I met my wife, and uh, we got tr we got engaged three and a half months later. We got married at age, age eighteen and so. Last Saturday or last weekend, we we celebrated forty-one years of marriage. Uh, and the other thing that happened that later on that year was Eamon de Valera, the ex president of Ireland, uh, died. So we were thrown straight into a major ceremonial. Um, a major ceremonial gig along the way. And it was absolutely amazing because we were, well, for a start off, we were we were doing foot drill and arm drill for what seemed like years, but it wasn't obviously. Uh, <clears throat> until we got it right. And, we, and it, it taught me a lesson in life. To practice till you can't get it wrong. Practice till you can't get it wrong. So we, we went and we did all that. And my life took off from there then. I have, uh, I was a, went straight into, we were involved in the football teams, shooting teams, gymnastics. Um, I went on my first overseas trip in 1978 uh, as a young corporal at the level. Uh, I went back again then, a year later, back to Lebanon again. In the meantime, I started developing different things, uh, one of them being a, a personal support service. Uh, for support to soldiers, um, and I got involved in the community work. Uh, I felt I, I didn't think there was enough in Mullingar for children, for instance, and so I, I founded a youth service. I spent six months walking around Mullingar with questionnaires uh, to identify what the areas were that were needed, and I got funding. And there's a youth service in Mullingar purely based on. Uh, my children, because I had a son and a daughter, I didn't, I didn't think there was enough there for them, particularly if you weren't into sports. And so I, I found I could either I could sit and give out of her and, and do nothing, or I could do something, or I could try to do something. So, and we were very lucky, we, we got that going. And then from that, I got another group going for Young Offenders, the, the I Project, and I got involved in community work in general. So, um, 43 years on, I've been to uh, eight different missions, Kosovo, Chad, um, Lebanon, Eritrea. My last trip was in 2015, when I was on the Golan Heights, where I moved to Mechanized School. Um, the Golan Heights it was, it was a challenge, but it was also, for me, excuse <coughs> me, uh, it was a personal challenge because as a sergeant major, you're a leader, so you have to set standards and, and you have to lead by example when you put yourself forward. So for instance, I, I haven't missed any time off sickness since 1978. And the reason why I know is I broke my leg playing football for the regiment. But <coughs> if you're asking me, I must be the healthiest man in the world. That's not the case, actually. Obviously, I was sick, but I chose to go in because I didn't want my lads going sick and catching other people for their duties. And the only way, the best way, I wouldn't say the only way, the best way I could get that message across is to set the example myself. So that's what I did, and that's what I tend to do in general. So last night, when I was doing my uniform for you guys, and my, my shoes, and getting my gear ready, and my wife was asking me, um, uh, how I was feeling about coming down here to you today. I, I, was, I, said, I, I told her I'd rather go to the Golan and Heights again and, and, and uh, serve uh, against the Al Nusra on, on the hills. But in actual fact, this morning, at uh, uh, 6 o'clock, when I was in doing the grasses, when they do them in the morning, I was thinking about how, how I was feeling coming back to you, back in here. Because uh, 46 years ago, I was sitting there at the table. So I suppose for me, uh, it's, it's, it's a great honour and, and it's a great privilege and you, you won't think of this now, but uh, I would actually be humbled to have my name on the registers here in this school 
because uh, I'm very proud of my roots. But whenever I start off telling people about myself in, in Mullingar or surrounding areas, uh, when I'm up at awards or stuff like that, uh, I introduce myself as being from Ballyfermot, living in, in Mullingar. And, and it, it's very important that we I come back to our heritage, you know. You won't, you won't get that now, but you should always, always be as proud of where you are, where you come from, and, uh, and particularly who your heroes are. And your heroes, as I said to you earlier on, are your mother and father. So uh, you're going to make mistakes along the way. Uh, I would say to you, don't be afraid to make mistakes, because no matter how many mistakes you make along the way, or how slow your progress is, you're still way ahead of others that are doing nothing. So, if you have your mind set on something, go for it. Whether it be football, carpentry, electrician, being a teacher, being a soldier, go for it. If you fall or you fail the first time, get back up, brush yourself off, learn from it, and, and go on again. And if it doesn't work out for you, don't be afraid to make a change either. Um, and don't stop trying, basically. And, and the last thing I would say to you is, uh, if you want to engage for going through life, do the small things right. So start off uh, when you go home this evening, and maybe make your mom and dad a cup of tea. You, they're, they're not going to know why you're doing it for them. And, and, uh, well, it's just a small thing. Make your bed in the morning small things and get yourself ready for coming in here. Um, I've had an absolute marvellous time in the army in the last 43 years. I'm, I'm sorry to be leaving it. I'm going to miss my lads. Uh, I'm going to miss shooting. I'm going to miss blowing things up. I'm going to miss uh, all the people I, I've been with. And, and my lads there that have gone to the, uh, on, on the overseas mission today uh, I, I was to be on that mission. I was getting out there with them for three months uh, in recognition of my service. And I pulled over, and the reason why I pulled over was because, I, and I really wanted that, I, you know, it was a lovely way to finish my regiment going over to as a lead unit for the first time, and I, and I so wanted to be there with them. But I, I, wasn't, I, I was only thinking of myself, actually, to be honest with you. I wasn't thinking of my wife and my, and my family, and now I have to think of them. And I kept the last picture to last <coughs> because uh, I have <coughs> this was the last. We, we have a system on the air we call ICOM, it's a computer system, an internal system. We do all our teaching, <coughs> our teaching in there. Uh, we do all our doctrine in there. We call it promotional. So when I, I, was, I was sending out a message to say goodbye, and I was wondering what photograph would I use. To, to uh, wish my lads all the best, and not just my lads, but the lads and other units. And I chose this one because the reason why I chose this one is because it goes back to what I was saying here. This is my granddaughter, Alicia. Uh, we had a community parade last year, and she got uh, her mum got her this open, <coughs> and we walked down the town together where it was marching the lads. Yeah. And it, it, to me, it just captured everything uh, about family. But what's important, and the important thing being people, about the standards of dress, um, and, and most of all, the distant lady, because she was, rep rep <coughs> she was representing my family that day. And, um, and I just thought I'd share that with you. So look, uh, I'm going to finish off now. If you have any questions, work away. And if not, that's okay as well. That's cool. And, uh, well, I'd love to do it before we finish, if you wouldn't mind, just get it. I'd be honoured to give a photograph with you that I can show my grandkids when I'm home, you know. So, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to ask now. You, no, that's, you, just one thing, you have to speak up. Because of it, I've been shooting and blowing things up, particularly artillery for 43 years. I actually have a deafness in one of my ears. Um, which I didn't claim for really, <laughs> because it was my choice. Okay. Always our proudest moment in the army. Pardon? Always our proudest moment in the army. Proudest moment in the army. Well, I have a few of them, to be honest with you. 
The day I passed out uh, as a recruit in Mullingar in 1975, um, my mother and father were there, my wife was there, my, my girlfriend at the time. Um, that was a very proud day for me um, because I, you know, I was spoiled that day. I, I was a soldier, it was something I wanted to be, I had achieved what I wanted to be and I had done it in the company of my family. So I was, I was very proud. Getting Sergeant Major, to be honest with you, is the highest accolade we can get because it's the highest rank um, as, as a non-commissioned officer we can achieve. That was very proud of me in 2012, you know. But, you know, getting my first medal in the Lebanon for peacekeeping was a biggie as well. And I won't lie to you, last year, 2016, when we celebrated our national heritage, was a huge day for me. Easter Sunday, I was, I was busy. What, what, what got me was Boland's Mill the next day. We were out in Boland's Mill the next day with a small group of uh, soldiers uh, unveiling the flag. And, and the people were up on Rings End Bridge and were some down near us. And when we, at the end piece, when we, when we went to do the salute, the people and the children started singing the national anthem. And the hair stood on the back of my neck. And, and, and it really caught the moment for me. So. And here today it was a proud moment for me, to be honest. With you. So hopefully you'll be lucky in life and you'll, you'll get a proud moments like this as well. Yeah? What countries were you uh, My first one was Lebanon, and I, I went back there four times. Uh, the, the first two were in, were, in the, were in the early days when we first went in. There was a lot of shelling and shooting going on. We used to have a lot of bunker drill. And uh, we, we used to call it ground talk, where when the bombs started, we'd have to get the lads into the bunkers. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting insight because you, you're seeing the different cultures. Uh, after that then, I, I, went, uh, I went back 20 years later to Lebanon. And what I loved about it was, and it gave me great hope, was the Irish had been there for that 28 years. There was an infrastructure there taking place, there were schools, there were houses, and I had, I had huge hopes for the peace, because um, it was just magnificent to see the difference between the early days when we were taking cluster bombs out of the ground so people could, could uh, plant crops or, or give them escorts. To go back to all this, you know, and find it was, it was there were schools and, and young people were being taught, and we were breaking down barriers. And the Irish are very good at it. Well, I went back for a fourth trip in 2014, and I could see it starting to decline again. And, and sadly, the reality is there was probably no peace there. Um, after that, then I went to uh, Africa, in Eritrea, Kosovo, Chad, and the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights being the last one. And, and I know there's a big, if I could just say, I know there's a big thing about refugees and all this uh, in Ireland. The more than those people that were in, in uh, the jail, that's the school in Chad. No more than those people there, the Syrians have nothing. They have no life over there. They're living, but they have no life. They have no stability. And when people ask you why you need an army in Ireland, what Ireland does is we offer stability and security to the country and to the people for foreign investment. When foreign investment are looking at a country to where, where, they, will, where they will put in businesses and, and work or investment, the first thing they look for how secure, how stable, how stable is that country. And in the background of all of that is the Irish Defence Forces. Uh, so I, I, I've eight missions. Uh, every one of them was completely different to the other. Every one of them was challenging. S uh, some of them were more dangerous than others. But the most important thing of the lot was the army come back to people. Did you ever get shot? Me? No, but uh, there was a couple of people trying to... In the early days of the Lebanon, um, we, we, we did a lot of shooting, uh, both back and forth, uh, which was... Particularly the second trip I did in 1981, we would have had a lot of engagements with uh, And I suppose, you know, you, 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 you don't think that you're going to be killed, you're going to kill or be killed. But there are times that you, you would 
you wouldn't see it too unlikely of happening. So our mantra, particularly going to the Golan Heights in 2015, I, I, I worked the lads hard on that one because we were going into a, a, a dangerous area. We trained, I said it earlier, we practiced, we trained till we couldn't get it wrong. So every drill was a specific movement and it's drills that have kept us right. I said it here earlier on, we're well disciplined, we're well equipped, and we've been lucky, to be honest with you, that we haven't lost more. But, but we have had to engage people. Uh, it's not our priority, but we've had to do it, and, and we will do it again if we have to. What? Sorry? Secondary school. I went up to uh, uh, what did what I call the tech across from Ankle? Colmore. College. I, I wasn't there very long, but I was very good at art. And, and funny enough, my, my granddaughter, Alicia, is excellent at art. I always had a flair for art. And now and again, when I draw or something, she kind of she tends to be amazed that, that her, her grandfather could actually do this. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to Do you want Kids, kids. Do I have kids? My own kids. Mm -hmm. I have I have a beautiful daughter called Rebecca, and uh, she uh, she she was at first, and of course when we got married, we, we got married. We were married for five years before we decided to have children. So we were living the good life, and, and when my wife decided she wanted to have children, I was kind of a little bit taken back. I don't want to know. But, uh, <laughs> Well, what was amazing about Rebecca was um, Rebecca was conceived before I went to, on my second trip to the Lebanon. So when I went off to Lebanon, uh, my, my beautiful wife Frida would, would wave me off. And when I came back, and I'll never forget it, I got off the train in Mullingar because the, the transport system wasn't so good in. And this girl came running towards me. Uh, Rebecca was born a couple of months later. Uh, two months there, and uh, I never looked back. The minute I saw her, I had a son and children. And David, my son, was born five years later. So I have two children, a boy and a girl, and I have three grandkids. Alicia, A.G. Um, Alicia actually was born when I was in Chad. So I landed at Dublin Airport with be be this most beautiful baby. And uh, my mother had passed away that died the year before, so a bad year for me. So that Rebecca or Alicia came along, you know. Uh, and then my, my son David had his children over actually over in Canada, Le uh, Amelia and Jamie. So, but they're all at home now. Sorry. Well, I'm embarrassed to see you straight What? What army? Army base? What army barracks? Or bigger party. I was, to the, I was, I was promoted sergeant major the Fort Field Artillery Regiment, based in Costume Barracks in Athlone. I'm oh, sorry, based in Colin Barracks in Mullingar, right now. Uh, and I, I served most of my career there, 49 years. But it was closed down as part of the reorganisation. So uh, we moved into Athlone, we're in based in Athlone Barracks now, and we come under <coughs> two artillery regiment under the formation. Uh, that, that was a hard thing for me because I. Uh, I grew up I grew up in that barracks in Mullingar. It had a lot of sentimental value to me. And uh, uh, it was very much a, a community barracks. Uh, we worked hard to, be, to get out to, into the community. And we, we'd have open days, we'd have masses. So we used to bring all the people in. But consequently, their, their sons and daughters used to join me. So when we marched out of Mullingar in 2012, it was very, very difficult for me as the sergeant major. But and I was going to leave the army, to be honest with you. But I had to think about other people. And, and, and I go back to when I said I, I, I put myself forward as a leader. When you're a leader, you, you can't just think of yourself. So I had to consider, if I was feeling this way, how are my lads and their family feeling? So I let them out for the year. And, and we, we've set up in Athlone now. And that's where we're based, Athlone. Well, I've been, out over, I've been over in England with the British Army. Done the Royal Artillery stuff, done the Snipers course. You know, I've done different stuff along the way here. So. Did you have any brothers or sisters in the army? <coughs> my two grandfathers were start off, 
they fought in, in the Great War with the British Army. Um, my grandfather on my father's side, he got his leg blown off. He was in, actually he was in the artillery like myself. But the beauty about being in artillery is we can do the infantry lads job as well, whereas they can't do ours, you know. That's my only. But my grandfather on my mum's side, he was uh, with the Royal Dublin Rifles. And amazingly enough, I only heard last year, through the 2016 thing, my grandmother used to smuggle arms around for Michael Collins. And when my grandfather came back from the war, he fought with Collins in the Civil War. He always maintained, by the way, that, that the, the worst war he ever fought in wasn't the Great War, it was the Civil War in Ireland, because we had families against each other, uh, and brothers and sisters, and it was a very difficult period for him. So, uh, I have one brother joined the army since. He only joined for six years. He didn't like it. It's not for everyone, you know. Uh, and Tony, my brother, he actually was a pupil here. He came to Mullingar, he did three years in Mullingar, and then he transferred up to Dublin, and he did three years there, and then he left. Well, I, I'm the only one, and my son or daughter ha haven't joined, and so it'll, it'll close with me. Have you ever been tased yet? Have you ever been tased? Tased? Is it a taser? <laughs> 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 i tell you what, uh, you don't have tasers in the army. Well, we, we, we remember I was showing the, the, the slide earlier on where we were doing the, the, the CRC, the batons. Um, we only use batons straight out. We don't use mace or anything like that. But we were trained with the guards. We have done a lot of training with the guards, particularly when we were in Mullingar. And, and I don't know whether you have seen there's a, there's a small, long uh, police car. You'll see them driving around there. Uh, they have tasers. They have machine guns. They, they have... Magnificent array in there. I, what we have done was we, we, we experimented with the sea at the lower border just to see uh, how they would affect you. It wouldn't be nice to get a book. It does knock you. I mean, just to get a little dirt uh, is, a, is a shock if you do the fun. But to have it on full table, I can see how they could drop the person. But they save lives. You know. Did you ever have to use a weapon on anyone? Mostly in the Lebanon and then in, in Golan, where we, we exchanged fire. Did we, in, in the Lebanon in particular, in the early days, we had, uh, it was one week, we must have fired about 8,000 rounds. Uh, but in, in those days, you wouldn't see the evidence. You get up the next morning and it, 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 nothing has happened the day before. Um, there are other soldiers, we, in, in Lebanon, you probably know, we lost soldiers in fire, <coughs> in fire fights and, and because they killed uh, some of the belligerents that were over there. So that what happened was there, there was, there was an escalation of violence. The Irish army were, were there to defend people and they defended them. And in doing so, they killed some of the others and then the fight escalated. As a result of that, uh, we had two soldiers, small at home, Barrett, that were kidnapped and murdered later on. You know. But that's that's unfortunate. And that's the reason why it's the reason why uh, we are deployed overseas. We go overseas because there are problems in those countries. And in actual fact at the moment where there are more UN peacekeepers deployed in the world than ever before. So there's a lot of tension and a lot of escalation in the world. And, and the only thing that will keep it right the likes of yourselves, what you bring to the to society, you know. Um, see on the slideshow, see the people in the black cars? Yes. Who were they like? They, they were the bad guys. Um, I was actually going to point them out earlier on. Why were they like green? You know, <coughs> see, for a start off, uh, that was Chad. The, 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 a lot of people in Chad had nothing. So these guys got arms, and, and so and, and they were murdering and, and doing other things to people that weren't good. But uh, <coughs> we're basically thugs and cowards. Because the, the normal people in society are not killing each other. They're just law-abiding citizens. All people wanted to do go out in, in Chad was learn schooling, to get educated, to grow up and raise a family. Those other people were, were in a, a power thing. So, 
in their arrogant way, they would wave at your gold boy. But unless they shot at us, <coughs> so unless they shot at us, we couldn't engage them. Because we were there, whenever we go to a country, we're there as a guest of the host country. So when Chad invited the UN over, our mandate was to, re was to protect those people. For four years that we were there, that's what we did. They had, they had a life that they could go out and collect wood and water without being attacked, without being murdered. And <coughs> it was very rewarding to know that, that for that four years we made a difference. You know? so, what age are you? What age are you? It's a right question. Well, the average age of my regiment, <coughs> this is the funny thing about the army, and it's a great thing about the army. The longer you stay in the army, the younger you get. Because what you do is, there's 240 of my lads in the regiment. And, and you, you get everyone's age, and you add them all up, and then you divide it by 240. So the average age of my regiment at the moment is 30. So, in one sense, I'm 30, and I only feel 30, because I was in the gym last night, and I'm, not, I'm doing okay, and I'm holding me on. Uh, but in reality, I'm, I'm uh, 60 on Christmas Day. And on Christmas Day, I become a civilian because you can't serve in the army at 60. You're, at this stage, you were supposed to say, God, you don't look 60. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 How did they earn their medals? How did they earn them? The medals are, are, <coughs> are mainly for UN mission or overseas service. This is the one we got last year for celebrating the papers of 2016. Um, and, and this one here is for service. Uh, the bar is for 21 years. Uh, so you get a medal for, for your service, <coughs> for, for peacekeeping. Uh, the Nobel Medal that was, was awarded to was actually by the United Nations. It's a Nobel Peacekeeping Medal because of the fact that I said earlier we have a huge history of peacekeeping around the world. But it's important to say those medals. Um, for every medal you say I have, or for most of the got, or the badges I have, I wouldn't have them without my wife, Rita, or my family, because they support me. So for every medal or every accolade I get, or every promotion, it belongs equally as much to my family, particularly to my wife, as it does, because she can with me along the way. Do you know if the US and North Korea ever war, would you ever help one of them countries? Uh, you see, I'm going to give, give you a typical example of where it We all know North Korea is, is, is at the maggot at the moment, and Donald, we have Donald Trump on the other side. And so you have Donald Trump and his twin in North Korea who are. Who are but the, the problem with that is. They put people's lives at risk because <clears throat> they like the. Who asked me about the lads in the car? The bad boys. They're, they're very much the same. They're very arrogant because they have power. But what they forget is, and, and I keep going back to this, if they don't have, <coughs> if they don't have the support of their people, they have nothing. In North Korea, uh, they they keep control of the people. They keep their the people subdued. We don't know what's going on in North Korea a lot of the time, because uh, so they don't have freedom, and it's something that we, we take for granted in Ireland: freedom of speech, freedom of movement. We take it for granted, so we won't say anything and do anything we want. But we, we do that at price. We do that because we have uh, stability. We have a, a government. We have a, a guard, uh, Shia Khanna, and we have defence forces to protect them. Those countries are not so lucky. North Korea, you don't have anything because unless the, unless the, the leader says they have it. The other countries that we're in, Chad and that, they have nothing. In America, you have a lot of everything, but they have nothing either, uh, unless they get to grips with, with their president. And that's why no man should become more powerful than the people. People must always have the vote, they must always have the say. So, if, if you were to, would I fight for North Korea? No. Would I fight for America at the moment? No. But would I fight for peace? Yes. <laughs> in South Korea, some people, I think some people have to leave the army for two years because some 
and North Korea could attack. Conscription. Yeah. We, we, uh, the, the, the British Army had conscription during the, the, the war. They didn't, they, didn't, uh, have a, they didn't extend that to Ireland even though they were, we were under that control. The only, it was only in England. People have their own different views about conscription. Is it good for discipline and all this kind of stuff? Uh, I have mixed views about it. For me, soldiering is a profession and it's an honour to be a soldier. But it's not for everyone. Um, so, can, would conscription work in Ireland? I don't think so. Um, and, and do we need it at the moment? Not at the moment, no. But uh, in South Korea, where you have an enemy on your border, I could well understand why they would want to have people trained. It was the same in Israel. One, one of the interesting things with Israel, when I went first there in 1978, was that everyone carried a weapon. You go into a shop into a, uh, to get a cup of coffee, was someone serving it had a machine gun on the back. Everyone, you know, teachers in the schools were walking around with arms because it was a siege mentality. You know, is, is that freedom? No. no. You're free. So I'll uh, just take it. Yeah. On a scale of 1 to 10, how hard was your train? Beg your pardon? On a scale of 1 to 10, how hard was your train? How hard did we train? Yeah, on a scale of 1 to 10. How hard was it? 1 to 10. So on a scale of 1 to 10. Well, it, 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 it's different skills, uh, and, and I'll say this to you, never stop learning. You, you'll find, no matter what job you go into, anyway, you're always going to have a teacher of some description who will teach, who'll be teaching you whatever the, the, role, <coughs> the role you have is. Uh, I, would, I would be involved as, as, a, as the regiment sergeant major for, for the regiment. I'm, I'm in charge of discipline, welfare, uh, standards, ceremonial. I'm also the master coach for shooting, so I have a big interest in shooting. So I, I, I would train my lads hard. I would put it at an eight, uh, depending on where it's going. If we're going up the fire artillery, then we kick it up a notch to maybe nine or ten. And then when it's low key, we, we drop it down to five. So we, we give them a, a, a break, you know. It's important to get a balance of everything, uh, depending on the skill. The, sniper, the sniping, for instance, uh, there are seven skills in sniping, so you have to be very good to them all, otherwise you don't get the badge. So, uh, it, it's different levels, but we are well trained, and we're very, we have a whole diversity of skills. Uh, everything from driving skills. We have, in, in, in Golan Heights, in 2015, uh, we had seven females, for instance. One of them, Amy Cook, uh, was in her 20s. Amy was driving a 70 ton armoured vehicle with an expertise that belonged to in, the any army would be glad to have. And then I had a, a, a young gunner, uh, Emma Gein from Kildare. Emma was part of the ESST team. She was a D minor. And there's a very f a famous photograph took out there. We, we were cleared in, we were cleared in uh, minefields. And, and there was a photograph of Emma on her belly crawling into the minefield with a prodder. And she, you, you, you prod, so you, you put your hand out like that, and you prod in between. See, is there a mine? And then you move around. And only then do you move forward. They were training at, at 15 or 10. I know that doesn't make sense to you. But do you know what I mean? Depending on what the, what the priority is, that's where the skill is at. Uh, in, in, in those particular areas, you have to aim high, and you have to keep that memento high. So, for that six months I was in the Golan Heights, when the lads would be at rest, I'd be walking around the rooms to get the feel for the, how is how morale, particularly when the shooting was going on. We, we had a lot of shooting, and our, uh, I met a young lad, we had a, a thing where you, you wore your body armour and helmet, no matter where you were going. So I was walking down uh, uh, from the officer one day and I met a young lad. He was in his sports gear with, flat, with his body armor on and his helmet. And I said to him, you need to get a photograph of that and show it to your mum when you go home because it, it looks ridiculous. You know, it, it, was, it was a really weird picture. But say not to you go home because they, they'd, be wonder, they'd be worried about you. And the point was that he, he uh, he was still going to the gym to get physically and mentally right, 
but you, you had to go with, with the um, with the body armor. So that body armor and the helmet, wearing that constantly, was a constant reminder for lads that they were, they were, that we were in danger. And, and that in itself would be pressure, you know. Sorry, I think that man. What encouraged you to join the army? What encouraged me? Yeah. To join the army? Well, I, I joined the FCA in Griffith Barracks in, in Dublin for a while, and uh, it was, I had quite a mixed feeling about it. I, I, I had always, uh, listen, I had always an interest in shooting. My, my family would tell you when I was um, the young fellow, I used to be going around with guns, and you know, the way fellas go around all the time shooting and things. But I just started, I already was bringing that to another level. But, so I had an interest in an overview of things, but really what it was, what drove me to it on that particular day was when I seen the queue in the doll, in the doll office, and I said, that wasn't for me. My, my parents didn't bring me up to go on the doll, and I wasn't going there, so I went home with no money, and then, then I joined the army. For me, it just worked out really well. Uh, I totally embraced it, I had a, a whole... A whole group of young lads there, and you know, meeting my wife on the first weekend was no bad thing. You know. <laughs> what car did you come in with? Mm. With me at the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I have a Nissan. It's called a Nissan Patrol, and, and my driver today is John Dooley. John Dooley. Yeah, John is usually always late with me. You know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it, it's a Nissan, and it's a very, it's a very, it's a. It, it, a car we use on the ground a lot, you know, when we're going down with the bones. Are we going over your time? They're just a sack of lunch right now. Okay, well look, I, I, can, can I ask you, no, to do one thing yeah. for me? Would you imagine for a second these guys are your new recruits down in Athlone? Yeah. And in your best sergeant major's voice, would you let them know what they have in store and what's expected of them? Because they're in the army now. Well, I said to you earlier on that. Uh, if you want to go out in life, do, do small things right. The one thing that gets you to any job is practically get you through schooling, get you through, no matter what scale you take up or what job, if you have respect for whatever it is you do, you're doing, you'll never look back. Without respect, you have absolutely nothing. And we go back to Donald Trump and we go back to North Korea and the boys in, in, in their big problem is they have no respect for anything. They have no respect for people, for their, for uh, rules, for regulations, for human rights, nothing. So for you going forward, lads, whether it be the army, college, a doctor, surgeon, a politician, wherever it is, if you have respect for the people that you work with and work for, you will never, ever look back. And that starts today uh, with your family when you go home to your mum and dad. They're, they're the real heroes, the real patriots of, of 2016, or of, of 1916, going right up to it, are actually parents bringing their family through life. Huh? Yeah, you Sorry. Know, you know who made us all become the Sergeant Major? Who's what? Sorry? You know you made it. Oh, when I live. I, don't, I, I wouldn't like to bet that at the moment, but I have here, sorry, I hope you late four months ago. We were doing uh, fire and movement in the game, you know, where you move ahead of people. I'll just tell you this funny story before I go. And the, the sergeant was doing the, the drill. Uh, so whenever we do that, I always, I'd always say, look, I'll go through force and see what way the terrain is. And that. So myself and another soldier were going through, and as you go through, the targets pop up and you, you engage them. But uh, he, he had introduced a thing called no contact targets. People with their hands up, so he didn't shoot them. Then you see the film The Men in Black. Yeah. Yeah. Remember where he goes into the kill room and, and he shot the woman with the baby in the house? Yeah. Well, that's what I did on, on, on this on this fire moment. This target came up in the hand of the air and I shot him 15 times actually. And the sergeant uh, at the head of me for, for uh, shooting the, the non contact target. And I told him, I look at if you've seen Men in Black, you'll know that the, the real enemy was the one with the hands up. Didn't save you from another rating, by the way, or as we call it, an admonishment. He asked about who replaced me. This here, 
This here uh, means a lot to me. This here is the, is the Sergeant Major stick of the 4th Field Artillery Regiment, which was disbanded in 2012. Every one of my predecessors, going back to the beginning of the state, is on that. And the year that he got. My name is the last name on it. Um, I have another cane that I made up for the, my new regiment. And I don't know who my successor will be, because they have to do interviews and stuff. But when he is identified, I will hand him over that cane. And I'll get him to carry on the tradition and the customs that we have, uh, have held in the regiment, in our regiment, for the last 70 years, long before I came. So I inherited an old regiment, or a new regiment. I brought my old regiment and the traditions to it. And that's, I'm sure there are customs and traditions in this school. Customs and traditions are good things. They don't hold you back. They shouldn't be used to hold you back. What you do is, they give you a foundation to build on and move forward. So the skills and the customs that your teachers are giving you, you look at them and see what can you add to it? What can you give to them? What can you bring to the table? So look, at gents, I, I, I could take that all day, but I know you're, going to get, you're going to be starving and you'll be giving out about me tonight then. So, will we sorry. get one photograph? Sorry, anyway. Yeah. One, we get one photograph. last photograph for uh, Sorry. Go ahead, you do it. My best friend in the army. I've, I've many friends. I, I honestly, I'm not just saying that. I, it's one of the things I miss. I've huge. We're like a big community. Uh, uh, I have. I have many friends. My best friend, to be honest with you, is my my wife and my son and daughter. To be honest with you. But going out from there, I have a huge array of friends. All some of them made uh, on service overseas that we never forget, and others. Uh, just got uh, acquaintances along the way. No, no. Did you ever hit anyone in the best <laughs> <laughs> If I did, I couldn't tell you anyway. Well, no, anyway. Well, I, I did, I've never had to see if or not, because uh, I, I'll be honest with you, uh, myself and my lads have, have a very good working relationship. You know I don't mess them about. I won't let, allow them to mess me about, so we, we respect each other. And so I, I, I've never had to, I very rarely had to use my voice, although on occasion I've had to give purpose and direction. But uh, that's no thing. Lads, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. I can't take any more questions because you're, you're, there's at least four teachers going to throw me out that window. <laughs> <laughs> I keep going on here. But listen, thanks very much for, for allowing me back to, uh, to see what, for, for, for me, what was a very important uh, basis for, for my life. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, uh, do you want to get, would you have time for a photograph for Yeah, you? no problem. Yeah, we got it. Wherever we just want to. Or just maybe at the front of the class. Yeah. 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 yeah.